today's topic is auto industry trends and navigating the effects of COVID-19. We have a special guest speaker with us today. His name is John Statari. And John is an automotive advisory and assurance partner at Deloitte. Um, and John is joining us all the way from the Sunshine Coast. I'm hoping that it's sunny out there for you today, John, as it is for us over here on the West Coast. Um, thanks again for everyone joining us. And I thought I'd just mention quickly and briefly, um, we have George that's joining us. Uh, he is the marketing manager from Tire Connect. Um, so he'll be helping us skip through these pages today. And you'll see a little question box down in the corner of your screens. You're welcome to add in your questions for John because at the end of his presentation, we'll make sure that we get some of those questions that you're wanting answered, uh, answered directly by him um, or possibly George himself from Tyconnect. So please jump on there, add your questions as we go and as they come up and we'll give you space to go through those later. And next is, I'd like to introduce John Statari. So welcome, John. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm going to hand the floor to you now. Thanks. Thanks very much, Pony. So um, thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, obviously, the objectives of today's webinar is to look into the, the current trends facing the auto industry. We're going to focus on dealership operations. And most importantly, the part that the service department plays in that dealership ecosystem uh, in contributing to not only dealership revenue, but the, the the effect that it has on other departments like parts and new and used vehicles. The source of our data today comes from Deloitte's e-profit focused database platform, where we have over 1,000 dealers reporting into us on a monthly basis across Australia and New Zealand. But firstly, a little bit about me. A little known fact is that I started as an apprentice motor mechanic over 32 years ago. Um, I've had the, uh, a lot of fortune in my career and I've worked across a variety of positions, including service and after sales manager in retail dealerships for one of uh, Sydney's largest multi-brand dealership sites. I then moved across into the importer side across a variety of roles, including homologation, where we did crash testing, for compliance with Australian regulations, after sales, marketing, and sales. I spent over 15 years as managing director uh, for Australia and New Zealand across two separate organizations and no less than four brands before moving into professional services where I've spent the last four years working with Deloitte. I'm a partner in the motor industry services division and we specialize on anything that has a motor and wheels and, uh, and we align ourselves across industries in Australia and New Zealand. Some of the engagements that we participate in include strategy, profit improvement, and mergers and acquisitions where we act for clients buying and selling dealerships and related uh, um, dealerships in other industries across Australia and New Zealand. I just wanted to spend some time uh, looking through the auto sector, focusing on the current trends. Our insights are based on both the financial information that we collect and we also incorporate our observations that we witness in the field, speaking to both OEMs and dealerships. So let's start first with the economic factors that influence the car industry. Interest rates at 0.25% uh, and this data comes from the professionals at Access Economics, a division of Deloitte. Um, that 0.25% is believed to be nailed to the floor and there's unlikely to be any interest rate movements up. In fact, interest rates being so low has ba basically taken away the firepower that the RBA has to restart the economy. Unemployment uh, for many years sat below 5%, which was considered by many economists as full employment has now moved up to 6.2 as a result of COVID-19. And many believe that that will slowly creep up through two stages. First, as the economy gets kick-started back into, into action, as restrictions uh, are lifted, we could see that lift to 8.5% based on JobKeeper still being in place. Now, many economists also believe 
that as JobKeeper is removed from the economy sometime in September, we could see unemployment as high as 12%. Now that's the most pessimistic uh, view and uh, many believe that it'll, it'll come in around that 10% mark. Inflation at 2.2% for the March quarter, that was pre-COVID. And most economists believe that that will actually weaken away as business and consumer confidence obviously is not at uh, trend levels. Exchange rates at 65 cents did dip below 60 cents and that's an 18 year low. Um, that puts us in a very strong position if we had uh, a, a thriving export market. Now, minerals, uh, resources and agriculture are those that will benefit. However, that is totally dependent on the current trade negotiations and trade war that seems to be uh, coming through mostly with China, our largest trading partner. GDP is at 0.6% and Australia was up to this time the envy of most advanced economies around the world. We've had 30 years of unprecedented growth, but many believe that uh, FY21 will result in a contraction in the Australian economy of 6.5%. That's a, a very large shrinking of, of activity in this market. Now, when we look at vehicle sales, uh, and this records them from 2013 through to 2019, the end of 2019, you can see the blue line there indicates the monthly volumes uh, recorded in VFAX. You'll see there a spike, which traditionally happens at the end of the financial year between May and June, as many businesses look to replace their motor vehicles and many people try and take advantage of any tax relief that's available at that time. The green bars represent growth or contraction of that month based on one year earlier. So we can see there in 2018, around May, we started to see volumes shrink. Now, it's important to remember that in 2015, 2016, and 2017, we had the largest number of sales recorded on record. 2018 saw that volume came, come back, and that was a tale of two halves. Up to the end of June, the market was still up on 2017. However, we saw a dramatic decline witnessed by those green bar graphs there well below the line towards the back half of 2018. And that contraction continued into 2019. And that's important to remember as we flick over to this next slide. Deloitte has been collecting data for over 20 years and we always saw a direct correlation between increasing volume for the industry and increasing profit measured as uh, net profit as return on, on sales or return on sales. Now that's simply the net profit a dealership generates before tax divided by the revenue, the money coming into the dealership. You'll see there in 2015 was the last year that um, dealer profitability was in line with increasing volumes. We alerted the industry in 2016 that there was a break in that correlation. And fundamentally, we started to see new and used departments uh, not generating as much gross, despite the increased volumes for those periods. That trend continued into 2017. Now, there are other factors like OEM incentives that came in. And the, the dotted green line you see there um, represents the monthly financials. And you'll see there a spike towards the end of the financial year, not only from that heightened activity of increased volume, but where most OEMs were tipping in large incentive payments for dealers who achieve target. Now, many believe that that's the cause of the de demise of dealer profitability as dealers chased volume at any cost to try and meet that incentive payment that today is constituting over 120% of a dealer's profit. 2019, had the effects, the compounding effects of the continuation of that slide in returns based on volume, plus we had lower volumes. Now, 2018 was a tale of two halves. We saw the first half of 2018, profit was actually up at 1.1%, and it really tapered away to 0.4% return on sales for the second half of the year. Now, when we take away the effects of Takata, and if we all remember, the Takata Air bag recall was starting to, to really uh, take swing towards the second half of 2018. 
if we take away the income earned from Takata, dealers made 0.1%, so barely broke even on average. Now, when you consider how much um, investment is uh, and capital is invested in dealerships, having no return really puts that whole model uh, in jeopardy. 2019, I'm pleased to report, saw a slight increase despite continued declines in volumes. Dealers started to make an impact through cutting expenses. My fear is that they cut expenses in many of the wrong areas, and that's across people and marketing, two of the essential areas that are required to get ourselves out of this mess. And if we look at Q1 in 2020, now this is pre-COVID, despite a continuation in volumes falling, dealers managed to get back to 1%. Hardly respectable, but certainly encouraging in the trend we're starting to see. So as I mentioned, it's new and used vehicles that's causing this deterioration in profitability. But there's a few facts I'd like to make clear that reinforce the importance of the service department and parts for that matter. A dealer makes four times as much profit from parts and service as they do from selling new and used vehicles. And to put that into perspective, on average, the dealership today, for every dollar of sales in new vehicles, they make less than one cent of profit. For every dollar in used vehicles, they make just over double that at two cents. But when we look at parts and service, a dollar in parts translates to 13 cents of profit and one dollar in service, a staggering 34%, over 34 times more profitable. Now, if we look at the composition, the organizational charts of many dealers, you'll find that most dealer principles have actually come from the service, from new and used vehicles as opposed to the back end of the business. But we can see here that the business has transitioned towards back end gross orientation, which means the back end is more important than any other department. Now, it obviously needs new and used vehicles to continue uh, to be able to generate income because we need cars on the road, but you can see there the profit has trended towards the back end of the business. And this is a trend that is happening worldwide. Another metric we, what we like to use is selling gross profit per productive employee. Now, employees are very important in the dealership because they contribute over 60 to 70% of a dealer's total expenses. There are a lot of people, it, it takes a lot of people to run a dealership these days. So it makes sense, the more productive those people are, the more chance you give yourself of making a profit. If we look at the productivity across the various departments, new vehicles generates about $3,000 selling gross profit. Now, selling gross is gross profit, less the direct department expenses. Now in the Deloitte model, we do not apply fixed expenses like admin salaries, rent, depreciation, superannuation payments to the department. They're applied after we take all the selling growth. So this represents just the profit in that department without all those items I mentioned. Um, so it's important that these are well above that break even line because about 50% of a dealer's gross is consumed by fixed expenses. So $3,000 per employee in new, seven and a half, or just over seven and a half thousand dollars in used vehicles. F&I is one of those unique departments that really has very little expense other than the business manager. So it, it makes sense that they would have the highest selling gross per employee. But parts and service, you know, service alone is three times more profitable than a new car department, reinforcing that message that the back end is where the profits are. A metric we use is, uh, and we've been pushing for many years, is parts and service absorption. Now this is essentially the blood pressure of a dealership. It's the first thing that we would check when we look at the health of a dealership. And what it basically does is applies the parts and service gross that's generated each month and determines how much of the total dealership expenses, other than those that are incurred in the selling of motor vehicles, those variable expenses. So it basically works out, what does it take to open the doors of my dealership if I do not sell one used or new vehicle? And how much of that expense is covered by my parts and service 
department. In 2019, the average dealer made 0.9% and achieved 52%, meaning that the parts and service department were able to cover just over half of those total dealership expenses. But the top 30% of dealers, based on return on sales, achieved 3.2%. Now that is a respectable uh, achievement. It may sound low, low compared to other industries, but the car business very much operates on financial leverage. A lot of the inventory that's in dealerships is actually financed. So every percentage point in return in sales has a big effect on return on investment. So the top 30 achieved 3.2% return on sales at 55.8%. So you can see little incremental gains in part service absorption has a dramatic impact on the profit that you're able to generate as a percentage of sales. And the same applies to the top 20% of dealers at 3.8%. And uh, traditionally that sits above 4% and they were able to achieve a part service absorption of 56.4%. Part service absorption is what we call the dealer principal sleep at night index. If they do not sell a car in a given month, how much of their expenses are covered by the back end of the business, which is more resistant to times that we're in today that suffer economic shock. The first thing that's impacted is vehicle sales. And I, I think we saw that last month with the decline of 50% in overall industry volume. And it happened so quickly. So what we look at is the gross that's generated within a dealership. Now, we take that across four departments. We don't include F&I in this metric simply because F&I does not have any cost of goods sold. So it's not really gross profit. We take gross from new used parts and service. We add those together to make 100% and then we determine or calculate how much each department contributes towards that. Now, the dark blue section on the, in the gra graph on the left-hand side is the service department. And you can see there, we're doing this month by month, which is very dangerous given incentive payments play a large part of new and in some cases used vehicles. But you can see there that when the economic shock from COVID-19 hit and be, uh, dealer's business was disrupted, suddenly the service department contributes nearly half of the total dealership gross and with parts, obviously playing a bigger part. Now, these are percentages. They don't reflect what's happening in dollar terms. And obviously, we've seen a dramatic decline in the dollars earned uh, by the dealership. So new and used vehicles have, in essence, fallen off a cliff in April. If we then move to selling gross profit, which is that profit that's generated, you can see in April, that's the graph on the right-hand side, the sum of service and parts is well over 100% of a dealer's profit meaning that new and used actually lost money for the, the month of April. That is not uncommon in some months, but tends to be positive towards the end of each quarter of which March would have seen the tipping of many OEM incentives. But it just reinforces the importance that a, part, a parts and service department play in a dealership's overall financial viability. So the current trends, if we deep dive into the service department, what we've got on the left-hand side is the contribution that each of the labor types makes to the average dealer. And you'll see their retail warranty and internal, in terms of percentage contribution, retail contributes the overwhelming majority. Now, internal includes used car reconditioning and also uh, new car pre-delivery and accessory fit at the time of sale. Warranty speaks for itself and includes Takata, and we saw that spike through 2018. Retail includes cap price servicing, regardless of whether that's claimed back from the factory. The big concern here is uh, overall uh, retail um, contribution is remaining the same. But if we move to the graph on the right-hand side, you can see the dark blue there in dollar terms, we're actually going backwards. And one of the big fears we had is that during the rush to get Takata airbags completed, and rightly so, franchise dealers may have sacrificed their retail customers. Now, customers these days are not prepared to, to, to wait longer than three days. And if the rush 
to get Takata fix pushed customers to wait longer than that, they may have gone to the aftermarket. And if they've done that, they may be lost to the franchise network for the next 12 to 24 months at least. Um, that is a big concern given that the majority of the profit from a service department actually comes from that dark blue line. The overall uh, service labor that's been generated dropped off in Q Q4 2019, uh, and we're still putting together those figures for, for Q1 2020, but I'm glad to report that there is an uptick, albeit less than the same period last year. So there's still some work to do. So is that because there's less cars on the road, we're selling less vehicles? Well, that's not the case because service departments are measured over a term called park. And we group those into the periods of zero to five year old vehicles, six to 10, 11 to 15 and 16 plus. Now dealers should really be focused on zero to 10 years as their prime opportunity. And if we consider that in many cases, dealerships have the first right to those customers, given that you know, new vehicles are sold, those customers generally come back for their first service. And it's up to the service department to give them an experience that wants them coming back. Um, generally, franchise dealers do a very poor job of retaining customers outside the manufacturer's warranty period. Now we've seen in recent times that move from three to five years in most cases, some are up to um, seven years in the case of Kia. Now that is retaining customers, but we're still seeing far too much leakage up to that 10 year period. Now, despite the fact that we've seen a decline in volumes in, in recent years, you'll see there the opportunity in that zero to 10 years has actually increased from three years ago. So there's no reason why franchise dealers should not be increasing their, um, their revenues. When we surveyed customers and we followed, uh, we separated that survey through the, the stages in life. That's no kids, young families, older families, adult families, and then empty nesters. You can see there that over 60% of customers are unlikely to take their car back to a car dealership represents a great opportunity for independent workshops and chain workshops, but really hand on heart, I think the, uh, the, the franchise network really has to look at these figures and answer a few questions as to why. Why is it that well over half would rather go to an independent workshop than to a franchise car dealer? When you consider that franchise car dealers should in fact have trained, fac uh, sorry, factory trained technicians, should be able to do, do the job quicker and have access to the latest tools and equipment. Um, you also have a reputation or you, you also have a relationship with that customer. So you're in the box seat to retain them through their entire life. Yes, used cars plays a part, but let's face it, you know, we still have the ability to refer, uh, have referrals from customers that we service. And my experience coming from service departments, working through uh, into distribution and then into professional services, there's a long way to go. Dealers are addressing some of these concerns and really improving that customer experience, but there's a long way to go. And OEMs are now focused on it, knowing the importance that service plays in the overall dealer profitability. So what are we seeing out there of navigating not only that decline, but navigating COVID-19? There's a few things um, we need to, to look at here. So the first, in terms of our people, and that refers to not only your staff, but your suppliers, customers will deal with separately. The number one prior, priority in these times is the health and safety of your employees and your suppliers, no matter where they are. And a great way to do that is to communicate regularly with them and clearly to minimize any uncertainty. In this period, we've seen a lot of technicians being stood down uh, for various reasons, whether that's split shifts to try and minimize the chance of infection. It's important that they're kept up to date, not only with the strategy you're employing today, but when you're likely to come out of that. And the government's been quite clear, they've issued uh, clear guidelines in terms of the stages as we get back to normal life. It's important that you're ahead of the curve and communicating with your staff and suppliers 
as to what your plans are as the economy starts to open again. Rethink roles and rosters. You know, we're in a different trading environment. If you're in a reduced trading environment, it's important that you communicate that. And sanitation, distance requirements, you know, how are you going to engage with your customers? There's no point leaving that to chance. You run the risk that they will walk away if they don't feel safe. Um, and one thing that we've seen a, a huge cut in is the development and training of your staff, in particular apprentices. It's important that you maintain that through these periods. As we work through opening of the economy and, and re reduction of in, uh, the restrictions or release of the restrictions, you're going to have to see an increase in productivity. And that's only going to be coming through if we're able to train our staff and make them more productive, give them more skills. Customers, advising your customers of your new operating plans. One thing we've been pushing for many years is time of day booking. And there's never been a better time than now to start educating the customer as to the benefits of that. And that'll alleviate those that congestion in peak times in the morning when uh, opening hours, when you tend to get 80 or 90% of your customers dropping off their vehicles. Uh, implementing a, a uniform customer sanitation procedure and communicating that with your customers is imperative in these times. And many OEMs have taken the initiative and dealer groups of communicating with their customers, making them feel safe and reassured that if they take their car in for service, there's no chance of infection. Ensure the infrastructure is in place. And, you know, we're in times where we tend to do things that we wouldn't normally do, and that's picking up and dropping off vehicles. Now, many customers aren't comfortable with giving credit card details over the phone. So do you have mobile FPOS terminals to facilitate payment? A proactive sales approach, and across those next three points, it's important that your message and tone is supportive of customers in this difficult time. Uh, we can't take anything for granted, and the pain and uncertainty that you and your staff are feeling is certainly being felt by some of your customers. It's important that you maximise opportunities because you're going to see less cars coming through your service departments over the next uh, few weeks. Upselling is not a sin. You know, you have a duty to your customers to find essential repairs that could impact the safety of their vehicles. It's important that you're communicating that with your customers and working with them on payment solutions. You know, many of your customers are going to be in a situation where cash flow is tight. So offering um, other alternate pay solutions like zip pay, open pay, open pay uh, is important in these times. It ensures that you get paid and allows your customers to navigate through this period of financial difficulty. So what is considered best practice in these times? It's all about bringing your customers back. And the ultimate goal here and measurement is customer retention. And I urge you, if you're not measuring it today, um, measure your customer retention by year, by year of sale to see where your leakage points are. It'll allow you to go in and start investigating what the causes are of that. Many OEMs will do this for you. It's simply a matter of calling them and gaining access to that data. And it's all about service follow-up, you know, ensuring that you're communicating with your customers and informing them of when their services are due. One of the best practices is actually booking the next service when they're picking up their vehicle from the current service. That ensures that they're booked in, you've got a commitment from them, and then you just need the follow-up procedures to reinforce that and inform them of when that date is due. Customer satisfaction is playing an important part. And I have to say, working in both non-franchised and franchised sectors, the non-franchised sector have it all over franchise dealers when it comes to satisfaction of customers. There's a connection there, there's a relationship that's built, and in general, the customer feels more valued in that environment. We're seeing the slow introduction of telematics, and that is a, a huge step forward because it allows dealers to monitor how many kilometers are on vehicles and proactively book based on events rather than a time period. So you can now, and in the future, you'll be able to do it even more, see customers that are coming up to that crucial 15,000, 30,000 milestone and proactively book them in and bring them in if they're traveling above or below trend rates. 
and your CRM systems. Many dealers have CRM systems, but I have to say they're not using them to their full potential. They are very powerful tools. They contain a lot of valuable data, and it's important that one, the data is uh, put into those systems accurately, because if it's not put in correctly, the, the data that you're operating on won't be accurate and you'll be making mistakes. So if we go across the six most important factors, when we talk about people, these are internal people. You know, do they have the right skills? Are they trusted advisors? You know, do your customers come to your service department and ask questions that are considered, you know, motoring trusted questions that they'd only go to someone that they truly uh, value their input from? Are you welcoming and are you COVID safe when people come to your dealership? And do you have a customer experience strategy and are you conducting online surveys? And more importantly, not only conducting those surveys, but acting on the information that you collect from them. Are you considered convenient? You know, trading hours, the location of your service department. And if you aren't convenient on a location basis, do you offer a pick up and drop off service? Is it easy to schedule an appointment with your, your dealership? And many of our in dealership consulting uh, involves that customer online interaction. And I'm staggered at the amount of dealerships that have been inv invested either through the OEM or through their own means to have an online portal that simply does not work or is not easy to navigate. That is a, a huge negative. You're better off not having an online portal if it's not going to work. And the benefits of quick service, and I'm talking about express service here, which requires time of day booking. This has been the biggest bugbear of mine for many years. And one thing I'm trying to push dealers to do, try and educate the customer to the benefits of time of day booking and the fact that they don't need to leave their vehicle, they can sit and wait, or they can simply uh, borrow a loan vehicle for an hour as opposed to the full day. Um, this is a huge advantage, but requires time of day similar to a dentist or doctor appointment. And there's never been a better time than the current environment to push that through and explain the benefits to your customers. Change management has never been easier than the current environment. People need a, a reason to change and I think COVID-19 has given, given them that. If we look at parts, you know, you obviously generally put genuine parts in the vehicles that you service. And the availability of those plays an important part. The last thing you want is, is customers having to come back because you didn't have those parts available on site. If you don't have those parts available on site and providing it doesn't breach your dealer agreements, what are the alternate options? And that's all around minimizing the inconvenience to your customers. Now, we're not about trying to uh, sidestep OEM restrictions on, on the use of non-genuine parts. This is about customer convenience. And it's better to have that customer's vehicle fixed on the spot than return it to them because I can assure you the time, the more time it's back with the customer and not displaying any bad symptoms, the less likely you are to get them back and that's a big bugbear to parts managers uh, is the number of parts that are ordered for service vehicles that are then simply not used because the customer doesn't come back. Your reputation. Now, reputation is increasingly dependent on your online reviews. And it's something that many dealers do not take uh, too much uh, notice of. So Google rankings uh, are important. Now, we all know that a, a bad experience is likely to attract a bad review uh, in, in that Google space, your Google reviews. But do you encourage people to actually leave good reviews? Because if you're not, you're missing out on the improvement that they can have on that five-star rating. Are you recommended by customers? And more importantly, are you asking your customers for recommendations? You know, do you ask and, and seek um, their, their approval to potentially service the second vehicle in the family household. Many people don't believe that you will service anything other than the vehicles in that, uh, in that brand. And the importance of a good past experience. You know, if someone's come in, had their vehicle fixed and it hasn't been fixed the right time and they're waiting for parts and they've had to come back three times to repair 
a vehicle, that's not going to leave a good experience and you're unlikely to see that customer again. Pricing. You don't necessarily have to be the lowest price, but you have to be the greatest value for money. Do you work with your other departments? Um, the most important is parts to package service deals in season, uh, in, in you know, summer times for a, a, a summer pre, pre holiday special where you can offer exceptional value for money and get back customers that have lapsed, you know, have gone out that, outside that 13 month period since the last visit. Do you mystery shop yourself? And more importantly, do you mystery shop the competitors around you? Now, you don't have to take time and book a vehicle in with them, but you can pick up the phone and see what tactics they're using to attract customers to their workshops. You can then understand what it is they're offering and see why a customer would go there over you and, and potentially train your service advisors in the benefits of being with you. And that brings us to the next point, the added services. You know, Do your competitors offer replacement vehicles? Because if that's something you're doing, it's important that you mention that to your customers. You return the car clean and in the current environment, it's also sanitized. So do your competitors do the same thing? In many cases, they don't. There is a reason that uh, uh, prices in franchise dealers are generally higher than the aftermarket. Do you notify them of future service requirements? Not only the scheduled services, but do you give them an indication that their brakes potentially will need replacing at the next service? It's important that you start that communication early so it's not a surprise when they bring it in for the, the next service. They may have factored in that the next service is $150 or $300. You know, that nasty surprise that the brakes are needed when you knew full well at the previous service, it was likely that brakes, tires, and things like that that have, you know, a consistent wear pattern are going to need to be replaced at the next, next service. It avoids a lot of that argument and disappointment, once again, can build on the customer experience. So we're over the, uh, the initial shock and the initial restrictions of COVID-19, and we're now moving into the recovery phase. And it's important you would have by now implemented revised strategies in your service departments and in your dealerships. And we've got a three-phased approach to this it's important that you start strategizing around the future based on what you've learned over the last month. And that is across a three pillar strategy of reflecting, you know, what has worked over the last month and what are you proud of in your business? Whether that be the, the change in procedures or staff within your business, you know, what's been learnt and what's been missed in your response? Because we're only six weeks into this and it's important that you start learning and responding very quickly, something that the car industry has not done well in the, in the past. What needs to change in your business? Because there's never been a better time to communicate change than now. Many people are looking uh, for, for guidance and accepting of change in these uncertain times. And what's the impact on your workers? It's important you understand and communicate with your workers and that's two-way communication. What are their fears? you know, and how can you put those to rest? And what's the impact been on your competitors? You know, many of your competitors will not be in business come September, mark my words. We're in a, a, um, a stimulus environment and uh, many uh, reports have, have commented on the fact that there are zombie in industries. Many industries were in strife before going into this and the government stimulus has allowed them to in effect kick the tin along the road. When we get to September and the stimulus is pulled away and many of these deferrals of GST and PAYG and interest payments need to be caught up, you'll start to see the true effects of this pandemic. Many of your businesses uh, on this call are in a great position to capitalize on that. So you need to understand what um, the position of your competitors are as we move into that recovery stage. Restarting your business, the time is now as restrictions are starting to lift. You know, what are the steps required to restart your business and get it back to whatever the new normal is? You know, social distancing and those kinds of things will be part of our life for the foreseeable future. Uh, what does this look like? 
and what products and services are you going to capitalize on? You know, things that come to mind are pollen filters and sanitation services, you know, things that you can potentially upsell during this, this period. What uh, workforce requirements have you got uh, that are crucial to restarting your business? And if we push that down the supply chain, you know, what suppliers are crucial to your business? Have you checked in with them and make sure that they can supply you with the goods and services you need to capitalize on the restarting of the uh, economy? And it's important that you comply with all the restrictions. The government has put a roadmap back to recovery. You know, um, stay abreast of that. And that does change from state to state. And it's very hard to, to um, keep abreast of that, but it's important you're up to date on what stage your state is at, when you're likely to move to the next stage. And it's important that you and your staff are ready for the changes and the opportunities that that presents. We then move to the revitalize stage. And this, you know, even post a vaccine, whenever that comes through, what can you learn and implement over this period that stays with your business and shapes uh, the industry for the future? You know, how has COVID re revealed any um, opportunities for you and your business? And how can you uh, capitalize on that and, and work with that and bring forward any plans you had for the next four or five years, bring them forward and implement them so you capitalize on the new world. You know, what's the workforce productivity lessons you've learned? We've all had to reduce our workforce, but in most cases, productivity has actually risen. So what have you learned from the current environment and what can we do to, to continue that into the future? Um, and has COVID uh, impacted your reputation? This is an important consideration. You know, uh, has the auto industry done a good job in putting customers' minds at ease or are we on uh, the naughty boy list uh, when it comes to, to customer perception? You know, just because things have happened in the past and I think the auto industry has done a fantastic job in communicating with customers and jumping on the fact that they still are open for business, especially in the service department and communicated the safety steps that they've taken to ensure that vehicles minimize the spread uh, of this pandemic. And how can you better optimize your supply chain? You've now realized how important some of your suppliers are to you. So how can you work with them to ensure that you have a better working relationship, whether that's downstream or upstream uh, going into the future? So uh, uh, an exercise that we recommend during this period is to map out your supply chain. You know, who are your suppliers? Who are their suppliers? and then working down to the customer and working out, you know, how important am I to the people I buy off, to my suppliers, and how important are they to me? And obviously identifying the gaps where there is a gap in the relationship and working on that so that you're better placed for any disruption in the future. Nobody knows if there's gonna be a second outbreak. All you can do is navigate through this with the best strategies that you can based on what you know today um, to ensure that you're you're well positioned to, to continue uh, with your business. Now, those of you that do sell tyres, I applaud you. This is a, a huge leakage point uh, for the industry uh, where people were going into having tyres fitted in a separate place or a separate organisation, and they were doing a great job in making that customer feel uh, obviously welcomed and offering their other services and potentially stealing that business away from you. So. That's one leakage point that you've taken away by implementing that. So looking for that next opportunity, I think is important. So that brings us to the conclusion of the presentation on 45 minutes. Uh, and I'd be happy, I'll pass you back to Vonnie, but I'm happy to take any questions. Fantastic. Well, John, Satari, that was um, some very valuable content you shared with us all. Thank you so much. I'm sure everybody watching today is going to top on board a lot of that information for their departments and teams. And it, you're right, it, it really is our industry has, all of our industries have changed um, as far as COVID-19 has impacted us. And I think we're all fair to, it's all fair to say that 
some of that material given there today can be taken across all industries, service departments and service industries. So thank you so much. We've, we do have some questions for you. So uh, George is putting them together for us and I'll read them yep. out for you, John, and okay. we'll jump in. Fantastic, thanks, Fanny. Yeah, I think just to uh, just to kick us off um, before we switch to the, the Q&A mode, I know we've got five questions sitting there. Um, customer attention, obviously really important now, um, more than ever, I suppose, for dealerships, especially since you said in, in September, there's gonna be a couple of competitors that um, go bust, which is um, obviously an opportunity for, for um, the dealer auto industry, especially. Um, what specific tools would you would you recommend um, to really optimize that customer retention mix that dealers have got? Um, obviously, Tire Connect is a tool that, that helps dealers um, simplify um, the way they deal with tires, um, which, as you said, is a key leak leakage point um, for customers. So it manages to bring those customers back from, from uh, competitors. Um, what other tools would you, would you sort of put out there um, for the people listening? I think, um, you know, if we, if we look through the reasons people walk away based on, on uh, the survey data, you know, the, the number one thing is actually reputation. You know, many believe it's price. It, it's not, it's reputation. And it's the way that they're treated at that organization, whether that be a franchise dealer or anywhere, really, we're not going to go back to a, um, a place that we don't feel comfortable. Why is it that you choose your, your, your favorite restaurant? It's because of the way they make you feel. Um, and there are plenty of alternatives out there. So um, understanding who or what in that organization is causing that, I think is the most important thing. And that can be done through obviously customer surveys. No point measuring customer satisfaction if you're not gonna do anything with the results. And unfortunately, many dealers do measure it and then put it in a drawer somewhere and say, yep, we're at 98% satisfaction. Well, are you really? Because the, the, the stats that we're getting uh, are not the traditional OEM or dealer uh, survey. A, a, an OEM or dealer survey measures adherence to a process. You know, was my car ready on time? Was it clean? And things like that. They don't have to ask the question straight out, was this a pleasant experience? You know, what could we do better? And what was unpleasant about um, your last visit? And would you recommend us? I mean, they're, they're the three or four questions that really matter. And it's important mm. that you jump on that. and. We tend to see the same issues in dealerships go un, unaddressed for many, many years. And, you know, we run a, a product called Dealer Comparison Groups. We put dealers, KPIs, their financial performance and KPIs side by side, and we might get 20 dealers in a room. And we'll go through those. And quite often when you see a dramatic dr jump in someone's performance, it's generally due to either someone being replaced uh, or being promoted so uh, it's amazing um how that you know is not something that's not jumped on earlier and it's times like this i think calls a, an action to arms and people really are looking at head counts and the competency of their staff mm. yeah. agree all right well um we have a question here for you from raymond bonnie john uh in relation to the service retention in your experience, John, what importance do you place on extended warranties, particularly ones that are, require the customer to service with your dealership to maintain the warranty? And also, do you see the ACCC changing any of these extended warranty service requirements in the future? Um, there are a lot of products and uh, they offer extended warranties. Some are given away for free, some the customer pays for. And they're obviously um, service retention tools. I have to say some of the more established players, I, I don't see as having an issue with the ACCC. In fact, they're in constant consultation with the ACCC. And uh, when the benefits of those programs are explained to the ACCC, it's unlikely that uh, they'll be banned. But there are some that are a complete, um, uh, are not in the interest of the consumer, I guess. And um, uh, those are the ones that I, I think the ACCC will jump on. But what are the benefits uh, to those? Um, yes, they certainly give the customer a, a reason to come back to the service department. But I get back to that first point. You know, if you're treating your customers well, there should be no need to have extended warranties and the like. Now, I'm a fan of extended warranties. I, I think 
they play a part uh, and, and some people want that reassurance that they're not going to be up for um, a hefty bill. Uh, it's like an insurance policy and the dealer should capitalise on that. But if you're solely reliant on extended warranties to get people back, I think you've got bigger problems. Mm -hmm. I agree. Right. I agree with that. <laughs> um, all right, George, is there an, another one that we have? Yes, it looks like we've got, so this is uh, from Tycoonet webinar. So if the service department is carrying the dealership's profitability, are you seeing new initiatives from the department to grow profitability and retain the customers? Um, most definitely. Um, for the last three years, this has been pushed and the report card suggests that it's either a D or a fail um, at, at this moment. But I can assure you, I, I deal with a lot of OEMs, the importers of cars, and they've taken it on, upon themselves to now drive programs to assist dealers in increasing that uh, service profitability and also um, trying to grow not only the customer base through re increased retention, but also the products that are sold. Now, uh, you've seen the advent of cap price servicing. That's a strategy devised to get people back on the premise that, you know, car servicing was too expensive. You know, we've seen a slight increase in retention, but nowhere near um, where it should be. So it, it points back to that thing that people just aren't comfortable going back to dealerships. And we need to understand why there's not one size fits all. There's varying reasons uh, across uh, each individual dealership has its own unique problems. But you know, at the end of the day, yes, to answer that question, most definitely, and you'll find a big push from OEMs. And that's, they recognise that service departments are going to play a big part in profitability. And most OEMs or all OEMs really need dealers to survive. And you know, service departments is, is the way to, to guarantee that they're financially viable. Excellent. Thanks, John. Uh, we have another one here from the Thai Connect Riddance. Um, are there any trends, initiatives that you're seeing in the US pre-COVID, which might be relevant for Australian dealerships to prepare for and, and or adopt? Yeah, I uh, had the pleasure of going to the NADA conference, which is the big uh, dealer, the National Dealer Association conference uh, over in the States. And um, we went on a a fact-finding tour across uh, many dealerships. Now, one that I visited um, had what we would call in this country groundbreaking strategies in terms of, of connectivity with their customers. So they fit a telematics device. These devices plug into the OBD connector uh, and are as little as $20, $25 each. That gives the dealer the ability to retrofit older vehicles that don't have that new technology in them and they can log in to see usage um, patterns and, and most importantly, the number of kilometers. But they also use those to, to signal uh, the service advisor in the dealership when that customer arrives. So they've got RF readers out the front of the dealership. All the, uh, the service customers are greeted on the driveway. And as that car drives in, the responder picks up that that car's arrived. The service advisor comes out on the driveway with an iPad and runs through all the information on that vehicle. It is so slick, professional, the customers love it. Um, and it, it promotes that time of day booking. You know, customers don't want to arrive at 8 a.m. in a service department and stand five back from the counter waiting to be served, especially in these times. So the US are, are light years ahead of us in that respect. And, and I urge the, the industry in Australia to get on board with that. And now, there's never been a better time than now to implement that. Mm, excellent. I hope to see that too. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have another one here. This, this is a great question too. So service departments seem to have all pressure, the gross dollar income, customer retention is won or lost based on the customer experience. What can or our OEM, what are they doing to support and serve the service departments to achieve this? Yeah, as I, I mentioned earlier, um, if we look at the, the profit model from a dealership and the OEMs, you know, a dealer makes, oh, used to make money from new and used vehicles and uh, F&I and aftermarket products, and then you've got parts and service. So there's a lot of profit centers in a dealership. An OEM only makes profit from two areas, and that's 
the selling of the motor vehicle, the new motor vehicle, and the parts. So, you know, what's the vested interest for an OEM to get involved in service departments? Their pure objective is to try and make more money for their dealers, which they hope will allow them to invest in strategies that do retain customers longer and get them buying new vehicles in that normal new vehicle cycle of three and a half to five years. So OEMs are spending a lot of money on measuring retention. They're spending a lot of money on customer surveys to understand why people aren't coming back. And they're spending a lot of money on programs like cap price servicing and cost subsidizing those to keep customers in the fold. However, the service departments have to play a part in that and make sure that it's a pleasant experience. And, you know, everyone's got that barbecue story of where they had a bad experience in a car dealership. We have to minimize that because it's, it's discussed far too frequent. Mm, mm. I've had a couple of those episodes myself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, excellent. I think that was very well answered. Thank, and I, I think um, based on the questions today, John, um, you've covered so much for everyone listening today that we, we don't need to go into any further questions. So um, firstly, I'd like to say that's a wrap for episode three in the series of More Than Tyres. Uh, today's obviously episode was covering the auto industry trends and navigating through these times of COVID-19. And as John had mentioned, we're seeing rapid change now and we're not out of it yet. So we need to keep our finger on the pulse and stay connected. So these webinars are a great way for us to by questions to and from one another and share advice throughout the service departments, whether you're East Coast or West Coast. Um, I'd like to thank George. Thank you, George. Today, George Green, our marketing manager from Tyres Connect. Um, and this session, just to let you all know, it is recorded and it will be available for you to all watch at a later time. So if you'd like to link up with us either on LinkedIn or Facebook, if you're not on those pages already with tire connect then please jump on and link with us there um, and we will have our next episode out in june so this will be a monthly webinar series and we don't have a date just yet so please stay in contact with us to see those times and dates for the next session